Hello, Uppsala. Hey, it's a great pleasure to be able to talk to you today about um, homeschool communications in a time of crisis. Why do homeschool communications matter? They matter in education because parental engagement has been found to be a key aspect of student school success. I'm drawing here on studies from um, Shirley Bryce Heath is well known, classic, what no bedtime story means, narrative skills at home and school, or Annette LaRose, unequal childhoods, class, race, and family life, or a recent study by one of Annette LaRose's um, former students, Negotiating Opportunities, Jessica Calarco's Negotiating Opportunities, How the Middle Class Secures Advantages in School. All these three studies um, were conducted in the US context and um, their key finding is that um, the parental ability to influence school success varies widely, but it is parental engagement is actually key to student success. So um, Shirley Bryce Heath, for instance, found that um, white middle-class parents were much more successful in training their preschool children or educating their preschool children in ways of taking from books and engaging with literacy practices that were highly valued in school. And so that confirmed an advantage onto those white middle class children right from the start, because the way they had been socialized into literacy practices in their preschool years translated quite smoothly into um, ways of taking from taking knowledge from books that were valued in the school. And this was quite different for um, working white working class parents who um, taught their children were also keen to teach their children how to engage with the literacy of school. However, they mostly taught them um, kind of obedience to the word and they failed to inculcate them or socialize them in a way that was creative and that was valued by the schools, particularly in the higher primary years. So the um, white working class children did well in school initially when um, sort of mechanical aspects of early reading and writing were valued, but once um, they were expected to think more critically, to engage more creatively with books, with um, their learning materials, they fell behind. And um, black working class children really lost out quite from the start because um, while their parents valued linguistic creativity really highly, they, there wasn't much written material in their homes. And so these children um, had the kind of creative skills that the school valued in the later primary years. But by then they had fallen behind because they weren't very adept at kind of listening to the teacher and engaging in the kind of mechanical reading and writing lessons that characterize the start of primary school. Um, similarly, Annette LaRoe in her study found that the way children were socialized in middle-class and working-class families differed significantly. And while the path of middle-class children and, and, and their socialization and practices gelled really well with the school, working class children just, although their parents were as keen as the middle class parents to, um, for their children to do well, they just didn't understand the institution so well. They didn't understand how the school as an institution worked and what kind of 
practices were valued in school. And so that was a significant disadvantage for the children of working class um, parents. And finally, Jessica Colarco extends that to show that middle class parents are really good at teaching their children how to lobby for themselves and how to um, make sure they actually negotiate with the, with, with the teachers about grades, for instance, or about needing extra help. Whereas um, working class children are often socialized into um, believing that marks are fixed and that um, you know, the teacher knows best kind of, so they are much more socialized into obedient practices that actually didn't confer um, a school advantage. So what we know from these studies is that class and race significantly influence, the, the, the parents' class and racial background significantly contribute to the school success of the child and that parental engagement in the school and um, parental understanding of schools as institutions is a significant benefit to the educational achievements of their children. What we don't really know is, and that's why I've got a question mark behind language, is how language proficiency in um, parental language proficiency in um, the language of the school, how that influenced children's educational outcomes. And when I ask that question, how does parental language proficiency in the language of the school influence the educational success of children, I draw on um, research that has shown that child language proficiency in the language of the school is of course extremely important for school success. And um, Ingrid Gogolin's classic about the, the diagnosis of monolingual habitus of the multilingual school is highly pertinent here. I've written about that in my 2016 book, Linguistic Diversity and Social Justice. The basic finding of that research, Ingrid Gogolin's research um, is in the German context. The research I've summarized in this space um, comes from around the world. The basic finding is that um, ling linguistic minority children face a significant educational disadvantage in school because of the linguistic mismatch they may experience between the language proficiencies and the language repertoires they bring to school and the language repertoire or the language management of the school. The school's language repertoire tends to be monolingual in the national language, whatever that national language is. And um, diverse, children lose out because um, they are faced with the double task of learning new content at the same time that they are still learning the language of the school. And they do this double task, they, they are charged with this double task in the presence of children, um, like those middle-class children in, um, in the studies I've just discussed, um, in the presence of children who are actually schooled and who already know the language of the school. So those children have the advantage that they only need to engage in content learning and they don't face this double challenge of simultaneous content learning and simultaneous language learning. Very often schools then um, you know, do not even recognize that minority children face this double challenge and um, they see this challenge as a deficit in terms of educational achievement on the part of the child. So they take a deficit perspective on the content learning of the child. And once um, such a perspective on minority children has been taken, it becomes um, a perpetuating a cycle of negativity that's often described as the Matthew effect, um, where as 
the, you know, the gospel of Matthew in the Bible that says those that have shall be given and um, those that don't have anything lose out more and more. And so basically children who come to school and know how to engage with the language of the school, they gain faster. Whereas children who um, do not know how to engage with the language of the school fall behind and um, the difference between these two groups of children becomes starker and starker over the course of their education. Now, I'm bringing these two bodies of knowledge together that I've just described to you, the importance of parental engagement for school success that we know from the socio sociological literature that's dealing with race and class, and um, the educational literature around the um, linguistic disadvantage or the educational disadvantage of linguistic minority children. Um, I want to ask in this presentation, how does parental language proficiency actually relate to the educational outcomes and to the educational success of their children? And to this end, I'm going to introduce you to, st to two studies that myself and my team have undertaken. And the first one I want to speak to you about is um, a research I've done together with um, Anna-Sophia Bruzon and Hannah Torsch, in which we've currently got under review, that investigates um, how school information is communicated on the websites of linguistically diverse schools in Sydney. And so that's also an opportunity for me introducing that study to you is an, an opportunity for me to introduce you to linguistic diversity in education in Sydney, where I'm based. So let me talk you through um, linguistic diversity in Sydney a bit. Um, what you see here is a graph <laughs> and the graph gives you the LGA, the loads and SES of LGAs in Sydney. Now that's a lot of abbreviations. So um, let me start with LGA. LGA stands for local government area and is basically a council area. So the city of Sydney is um, broken up into a number of large uh, administrative units called local government areas or LGAs for short. And um, some of these LGAs are extremely large, like the one that, um, that's cut off on your screen, the second on the left, Canterbury Bankstown, that's the largest LGA in Sydney. It has close to 400,000 inhabitants, so that's twice the size of Uppsala. Um, whereas some of the LGAs are um, fairly small, like the one that you see on uh, the far right, Wulara, um, a fairly small LGA that only has a couple of 10,000 um, inhabitants. The other two abbreviations that you see here are LOAD. LOAD stands for language other than English and SES stands for socioeconomic status. So now that we've got the terms clear, let me explain um, the graph to you and what the bars and the line mean. I will do that with the example of, um, of Greater Sydney. So Greater Sydney is all these LGAs that you see here together. So um, what you have in this yellow box is the average. So the bar, the bar gives you the number of households in Greater Sydney in this case, or, or for each of these LGAs, that speak a language other than English at home. And we know those data because Australia has a census every five year. The most recent census was only a couple of weeks ago in 2021. However, the results of the 2021 census have not yet been released. So the figures I'm giving you here are from the 2016 census five years ago. And um, one of the questions in the census is, whether a language other than English is spoken or what language is spoken in the home. 
And in, in Greater Sydney, as you can see, and you need to relate the bar to the left hand axis, close to 40% of households speak a language other than English. And um, as you can see, some of the um, suburbs like um, Fairfield, that's the one in the far left, or um, Parramatta, that's left to Greater Sydney, no, Strath uh, Parramatta, Strathfield, um, two left to Greater Sydney. These have really large um, percentages of people who speak a language other than English at home. So in Fairfield, it's um, seven, three quarters of the population, 75%. You can, and these figures are then related to this purplish line. The purplish line actually gives you the income in each suburb. And um, you need to read the income against the right-hand axis. So um, if we go back to Greater Sydney, um, the purple line sits at around 1,700, and that's the weekly income in dollars. So 1,700 something dollars per week is the average income across Sydney. Now, um, the way I've ordered the LGAs here is from the suburb with the least amount of average income to um, the suburb Bulara in the right with the highest average weekly income. So basically, you get a decline of socioeconomic disadvantage on the left to socioeconomic privilege on the right. And um, if you now put these two data sets together, the line and um, the loads, what you can see is that the most linguistically diverse suburbs of Sydney are also those with lower levels of income, whereas those suburbs with high levels of income, so the most um, advantaged and privileged suburbs actually have lower levels of linguistic diversity. Mulara um, has under 20%, which is you know, um, about half of the Sydney average. Okay, so um, that's an orientation to the context in which we've undertaken our study. Fairly large numbers of linguistic diversity, but also segregation around um, socioeconomic status. So the highest level of linguistic diversity in suburbs with the lowest level of socioeconomic status. We selected out of these, um, this fairly large number of LGAs, we selected six LGAs, and that were the most linguistically diverse LGAs in two um, socioeconomic, in three socioeconomic groups, two each for low socioeconomic status. So the two columns on the right say, um, low socioeconomic status LGA1, low socioeconomic status LGA2. And these two columns here in the middle are from um, mid LGA socioeconomic status. And um, the two columns on the right are from two LGAs with high socioeconomic status. In each case, these are the two most linguistically diverse LGAs within these socioeconomic status group and excluding very small LGAs to have sort of a compare and, and the excessively large one to have um, comparable sizes. I'm showing you um, this table here to give you an idea of um, the overall linguistic diversity. So it's not that one language really predominates. There are some languages like the Chinese languages, Mandarin and Cantonese, which really occur across the socioeconomic levels. And that's not surprising across, um, 
Within Australia as a whole, on average, Mandarin is the most widely spoken language other than English, and um, Cantonese is the third most widely spoken language other than English. So these languages can be found across the socioeconomic status, uh, yeah, across socioeconomic statuses. And then there are a couple of languages that really predominate in um, lower socioeconomic areas like Vietnamese, Arabic, um, Assyrian, Khmer, Tamil, Turkish. And um, we also have a couple of languages that predominate in the higher socioeconomic status areas like Korean, Hindi, Italian, Persian, and Japanese. There are two takeaway messages from this. One is that we have um, extremely high levels of linguistic diversity in the sense that no language other than English predominates. However, that um, within certain local government areas, and this is even stronger than within suburbs, there are actually clusters of specific languages. So um, these clusters differ, but languages do predominate on the local level. I also want to draw your attention to um, the bottom row, the figures for English only. And um, that's sort of the inverse of linguistic diversity in the sense that it shows you that in the lowest socioeconomic status LGAs, English only is really a minority proposition. So in one of the LGAs, we chose only 25% of the population speak only English at home, 29 in the other. In the mid socioeconomic status, it's still a minority proposition, but um, it's a large minority. So in the 40 percentage in both of the mid SEAs, LGAs, and um, Finally, in the, high, in the LGAs with high socioeconomic status, um, now English only is actually the majority proposition. Um, and we have you know, 65 and 69 percentage of households speaking only English in those suburbs. Okay, so um, going back to our study, so we chose these six. LGAs according to their high level of linguistic diversity and their socioeconomic status. Within each LGA, we chose five primary schools and we chose those primary schools with the highest level of linguistic diversity in each of these schools in each of these LGAs, excuse me, to examine the enrollment information on their website in terms of what languages are chosen to convey enrollment information, um, how is enrollment information in languages other than English conveyed, and what kind of information about the language management of the school is available on the website. We did that. We chose enrollment information specifically because enrollment information targets new parents who will not yet have access to other linguistic resources that the school may be able to provide. So once parents are in school, there are um, community liaison officers available. There may be community language teachers who speak their language, they may be able to access um, Australia's national translation and interpreting service to communicate with the school. Um, they may be able to access teachers who happen to speak their language and so on and so forth. So once um, parents are actually in the school, there may be other resources that they can access if their English isn't good enough to um, communicate with the school. But enrollment information is kind of information that parents need before they actually enroll their child in school, before they choose a school, before they actually um, 
you know, are part of the school community. And um, what we found to um, kind of give it away already is that the children of parents who do not speak English well lose out even before they've started school because the enrollment information on these school websites is so poor. Now, let me show that to you. So, um, as I said, we chose 30 schools. And um, this is just the distribution in terms of linguistic diversity and socioeconomic status. Um, some of the schools that we looked at um, have 98% of students enrolled in the school come from a language background other than English. So that's basically the whole school, right? So keep that in mind that um, we have 18 schools across low, medium, and high socioeconomic status suburbs that have um, 80 to 98 percent of students in that school who come from a language background other than English, who come from a household where English is not spoken, or um, uh, English may parents may well be proficient in English, they may be bilingual, but um, they speak another language at home. Um, we had hoped to actually have um, an equal distribution of the different percentages across the socioeconomic status, but um, the um, low socioeconomic status have very high levels of linguistic diversity, whereas um, high socioeconomic status suburbs have less levels of linguistic diversity. In the end, it didn't actually matter because um, our hypothesis that, hi hypothesis that um, high socioeconomic schools in high socioeconomic status suburbs would be able to, um, or would be more forthcoming in providing enrollment information in languages other than English actually turned out to be false. Um, none of the schools in our sample, none of the 30 schools actually tailored their enrollment information to the language needs of parents from languages background other than English. Now let me show you that quickly. So um, here we've got um, an example of the front page of a school. We've um, erased the name of the school. We're not trying to single out any schools here. So we've anonymized all the schools in our sample, but this is a typical, um, school website in that what you're seeing here is the header and the header kind of gives you the website architecture so then from there on from the welcome page or from the landing page you can click onto on the kind of information you are after like about our school how students are supported learning at our school innovation awards and recognition contact us um, all schools have a similar header all school websites or the front page has an image in that header. Very often, as in this case, the images of um, diversity. So we see students of different phenotypes who are visual, visually, visibly diverse. So that's very highly valued in the visual, but it doesn't flow through in the linguistic choices, as I'll show you in the second. Um, there is this welcome to our school and then um, this front page is, you know, goes down, it has a lot of information like social media feeds, news items, student artwork, all kinds of things. We focused on three pages in the end, the welcome page or the landing page and um, the about our school page, because that's where we expect to find information about what's specific about the school, including linguistic diversity. And um, that often has information like so and so many percent of our students come from language backgrounds other than English, but that's it. And um, we also focus obviously on the enrollment page um, that's up there in that menu. So it already takes, um, so you already need to be quite proficient in English to actually find the enrollment information. And um, this is particularly important because all 
the websites we looked at were exclusively in English. All the materials were in English only. So there was nothing in terms of like even, you know, like on commercial websites, you're all familiar with um, the possibility to switch to um, a version of the website in another language. So none of the 30 schools had a version of their website in a language other than English. And keep in mind that some of those schools have 98% of students coming from a language background other than English. So none of those schools has a version of the website in a language other than English. None of them even have like phatic communication, um, you know, this welcome to our school, this kind of segment is there on each of the 30 websites, but it's always there in English. So it, it never says like in, you know, um, in a school where most of the students come from Vietnamese background, it doesn't say anything like chow bang or, um, you know, hello in another language even, it doesn't, doesn't happen. It's exclusively monolingual in English. Um, however, there is um, the Google Translate plugin is available on most of the website. It wasn't available on all 30, but um, 27 or 28, so a fairly large number. And the Google Translate plugin can actually sort of deliver you an automated translation of the website. I don't really have the time to go into um, assessing the quality of the Google Translate website version, other than to say um, I did a study last year of the German and Persian websites um, of the Google Translate of um, a, a COVID website produced by the New South, New South Wales government and um, the translated version through the automated translation Google plugin was abysmal for both these languages, although both are you know, major well-researched languages that actually have pretty good automated translation tools. I just want to show you that once you actually, so if, if you are, you already need a significant level of English to actually identify that the Google Translate plugin might be able to help you to get information in a language other than English. But if you click on select language, you see this huge menu um, with over a hundred languages that is not tailored at all to parents in Sydney, in New South Wales, in Australia, in a particular suburb. It's the global Google Translate plugin that they use across the world. So it's very text heavy. You obviously need to be able to read the Latin script. You need to be able to identify the name of the language you are after in English. And um, you need to understand the um, ordering of the letters in the alphabet, um, in, in the Latin alphabet. And only if you have all those skills, then you can actually even access that very poor automated translation into your language. Um, so not tailored at all. Now, um, what this shows actually is that the, the, the Google plugin, the Google Translate plugin is really more of a nod into the direction of parents who might need a language other than English, but it's not very helpful. There is actually something that is a bit more specific. If you manage, despite all these challenges, to click on the enrollment page of the school, if you manage to find that, the enrollment page is identical across all the schools. And um, there, in a very text heavy text, it tells you that the enrollment form is also available in other languages, that there are translated versions of the enrollment form available. It also tells you that you're not actually allowed to fill in 
those other language versions of the enrollment form must be filled in in English. However, you can click on a translated version and then use that translated version as a kind of parallel as you fill in the English version. Now, of course, if you think about it, that's an impossible task. You are asking people who may not be able to read in English, because that's why you're offering them the translated form, but then you ask them to actually write in English on the English form. Illogical as that task is, if you click on translated version, on translated version of the enrollment form, you're actually taken away from the school's website and you go to a central website on the New South Wales Department of Education. And um, I'm showing you a screenshot of the page away from the school website that you get to if you click on the translated enrollment form. And um, I think you can clearly see that this is actually just really hard to navigate. It's very text heavy. Um, again, the languages that are given there, and these are um, this is a smaller number of languages, they are a bit more targeted to um, the languages spoken in New South Wales, actually. But again, the list is in English, the list is in the Latin alphabet. So again, you need to know the name of your language in English, you need to be able to read the Latin alphabet, and you need to be familiar with the, with the conventional order of the Latin alphabet. Um, the major language, the main language um, other than English in New South Wales, that's um, Chinese in the simplified version is not actually there on this list. Um, it's often called Mandarin and Mandarin is further down the track, but I mean, Mandarin isn't there either. So although I'm not showing you M um, Mandarin or Ch simplified Chinese, the most frequently spoken language in New South Wales is actually not there as um, the enrollment form is not available in translation. The other thing that makes the site really difficult to navigate is that it is extremely text heavy. So you could use all kinds of icons, like um, something that many websites do that deal with translations is, of course, use these little flags next to um, language names. None of that is there. But what makes this also so confusing is that we have these two columns. One is um, the languages column. And the other on the left hand side is actually another navigation column because you are now and if you are a parent and particularly if your English is, you know, if your level of English proficiency isn't very high, you don't even figure that out. It takes some time to figure out that you've left the website of the school, that you're now on the website of the New South Wales government, the Department of Education and that you're actually no longer on an enrollment website. You're now on a web page that gives you all the translated documents that are available on the department website. And so um, in, so it's C, this is um, a list of the translated documents and those that are high up, because these are the ones that you see first, obviously, when you get here is, you know, like anaphylaxis procedures for schools, appendix one, two, three, and um, anaphylaxis is just a really difficult word. And so um, it's just all very confusing. And um, so ostensibly, this is to support and provide information, enrollment information to parents who may not have high levels of English language proficiency. However, it is done in a logic that makes this kind of translated information inaccessible to people who have low levels of proficiency in English. So. Um, Yes, some translations are available of some documents, but they are provided 
in a logic, in a monolingual English logic that makes them inaccessible to um, those who lack high levels of proficiency in English. I just want to show you one more thing now from the actual enrollment form. So if you've managed to get across all those hurdles and get to the actual enrollment form, um, this is available in translation. There is actually a lot of language management going on on the enrollment form. Um, the, this is one of the sections from the enrollment form, and this section is actually repeated three times. Um, so it's about languages other than English spoken at home. And so the question here is, does the student speak a language other than English at home? We have this repeated for, does the main carer one or parent one speak a language other than English at home? And does the main carer two, parent two, speak a language other than English at home? So we have basically the same question three times, except it applies once to the student and once to carer one and once to carer two. And um, so this form, actually, the enrollment form does collect a lot of information about um, languages other than English. Um, at the same time, it does so in a bit of um, a, a backhanded or cack-handed way, really. It says, so please write the actual languages, for example, Swahili, not African. Punjabi, not Indian. So it kind of, it already sets parents up like they will be failing if you don't. So if you're speaking a language other than English, the likelihood is you will not tell us the correct name of your language. And um, so it, it sets up load parents as kind of difficult parents who need extra instruction what their language is, but it also singles out these two particular groups, Africans and Indians, as being particularly likely to make a mistake about their languages. And then um, it has three Australian languages where it's actually unclear why they are considered languages other than English. And um, so Auslan is Australian Sign Language, Aboriginal English, um, Torres Strait Creole. So there is a lot of racialization really going on that singles out these particular languages. And I don't really have time to go into that. But the point here that I want to make is the actual enrollment form, there is a lot of meta communication about linguistic diversity. So a lot of information is collected about what kind of languages are spoken at home, but then nothing is done with it. So no service provision is available. So um, to sum this up, um, the study that I've outlined to you so far shows that um, there's websites, even in suburbs where 98% of the students speak a language other than English at home, do not target their enrollment information to parents who from other language backgrounds or to parents who may not have high levels of English language proficiency. The information structure, the information architecture, excuse me, of um, any translated documents such as the Google, Google Translate plugin that provides automated translation or the translated documents that are available from the Department of Education through a link by leaving the website. They follow a monolingual logic, which makes them essentially useless for low proficiency speakers. And um, finally, any kind of language management that's being discussed on the website is almost exclusively about the imposition of English or kind of constructing some sort of deficit view of um, parents from non-English speaking backgrounds as like, you might not get the name of your language right. 
So what we've shown through this study is that the monolingual habitus of the multilingual school extends beyond school child communication to home school to school home school parent communication and that essentially means that going back to um, the relationship between parental engagement the importance of parental engagement for school success um, parents from non-english speaking background have much fewer opportunity their opportunities to understand what's going on is limited so this leads us to another question. How do parents actually experience this kind of homeschool communication? And um, we've examined that with another study that was focused on homeschool communication targeting linguistically diverse parents during the COVID-19 school closures. And um, our study was late last year, so it was of the 2020 New South Wales school closures. And um, the people involved in this research are Gigentul Bayou, Shiva Motari Tabari, Vera Williams Tete, and Ining Wang. We, um, for this study, we interviewed 64 parents from non English speaking backgrounds, and they fell into three large groups. Um, one group was from 20, a bit over 20 from um, in, uh, Chinese speaking backgrounds, another 20 or so from Persian speaking backgrounds, and then another group of parents from all kinds of other backgrounds, um, a, a large segment from African backgrounds in that third group. So um, highly diverse with a focus on uh, Chinese and Persian. And um, so for the, pre for the purposes of this presentation, what I want to show you is how, now that I've shown you how monolingual the homeschool communication is on the websites, I want to show you how in this moment of crisis, did the schools do anything different to engage low or Nisby parents and um, how did they go about communicating the requirements of home learning to these parents? How did the parents experience? So we've got the parents perspective here. How did the parents experience homeschool communication during this challenging time? And um, I'm going to focus on three aspects, namely communication that was directed at parents via the child and via other brokers. So let's start with communication directed at parents. Um, the box basically gives you the findings. One thing that we found was that there's very limited information targeting parents from load backgrounds and that conflicts kind of with an information overload. But both of this kind of conflicting information, limited information and information overload actually confirm precisely what we saw in the enrollment information that on the one hand side, there is no targeted information, but on the other hand, there is a lot of information in English and you kind of feel like what's going on. So, um, Marta, um, a mother from the Philippines, for instance, spoke about the limited information when she said there wasn't any clear direction. They just sent that app. So there was a special home learning app and a file of activities to do at home. But we didn't know if we had to complete everything. We didn't even know how to submit. We don't even know how to navigate the app. So a deep sense of, um, you know, we don't know what's going on. And um, so limited information. Yu Ti, um, mother from China or from a Chinese speaking background, um, similarly speaks about limited information, but also how this relates to the information overload. And she spoke about how many emails, that, that was a recurring theme. Like most of the parents um, felt that they were drowning in email. I just opened these emails and skimmed through them quickly. I did try to read these emails fast by using automatic translation, but I realized 
reading original English ones is actually faster anyway. I usually scan these fast and don't pay much attention to what's written there. And in a second, I'll tell you what the consequences of that are when I'll, um, so we see the result of limited information in the context of information overload is actually parental disengagement. The consequences that the child loses out as we'll find out from another quote by UC on this slide. So um, because the school didn't provide targeted information, parents were basically left largely to find out whatever they could find out and their main conduit of information was the child. As Diva, um, a mother from a Persian speaking background, for instance, said the school didn't really send out any detailed information around what things or what the setup would look like. I sort of like got my information from my daughter when she was saying, oh, they're saying we are now doing online school and you know, they send them a link where they could join in. So that's really not much. So clearly you can't support your child if that's all you know as a parent. Um, at the same time, some of the parents really enjoyed learning more about um, what was going on in the school and they felt a sense of this is actually a better opportunity to learn about school as an institution than they have ever had as Sinran, for instance, another mother from a Chinese speaking background said by eavesdropping on her classes, so her is her daughter. I can learn about her school and her teachers. Another bonus is I can practice my English listening. But of course, if you get your information as a parent through the child, that's always going to be fractured information and um, quite haphazard. So it's not a strategy to learn how to teach your child to socialize your child into the ways of the school. It's almost the other way around um, in that whatever is refractured through the child um, is some sort of socialization for the parents. And um, that can lead to significant child disadvantage as we see in this other quote from Yuzi who said, um, by the time his teacher called me, they had already returned to school. Only then did I realize that he hadn't handed in his homework during the lockdown when he was staying at home. So because it was unclear to parents what was expected, many of them actually weren't able to even supervise their children in the way they were expected to. And so um, that of course translate into, translates into a significant disadvantage for those children whose parents did not have the kind of English language proficiency that would have allowed them to supervise their children effectively. Some of the parents then sought out other resources and um, further information because you know they, they didn't get the information they needed from the school. They kind of were concerned about what they were getting from their children. And so they sought out other information. And um, the um, Chinese parents as the largest group often turned to other Chinese parents or um, Chinese language teachers if they were available. So Sulan, for instance, said, my English is poor, so I talk to other Chinese parents. I also talk to her Chinese teacher. Many of um, many parents had some form of online communication. Many of the Nesby parents that we interviewed felt um, they couldn't fully participate in the general Facebook groups or social media groups or apps that class parents had set up and felt a bit left out. But some of the Chinese parents in particular had actually their own WeChat groups or their, their own social media groups where they spoke in Chinese. And that sort of gave them another level of being able to gain information in some cases. And that was not available to um, speakers of other languages and smaller groups. Although um, 
one Chinese mother, for instance, also spoke about that, you know, we have a Chinese WeChat group and some of the um, some of the Korean and Vietnamese parents who can kind of um, come in because they learn more from the Chinese group than from the general school. Um, so the general Facebook group, for instance, as I said, lots of social media groups. Um, Vincencia, a mother from the Philippines, said, I have like a Facebook group actually for homeschooling, wherein we are exchanging ideas, like there are parents there that would say, hey, try this one, it's a really good app. And um, again, we see a certain level of haphazardness. So um, whatever, because there is this gap of solid information from the school, um, Parents draw on all kinds of resources that are available to them and they may or they may not be of good quality. At the same time, for some parents who had the kind of educational and social capital themselves to support extra resources for their children as Wendy, for instance, um, they could actually support their children to race ahead during the lockdown. And um, so Wendy said, we used the math videos from the SUMC platform and um, SUMC translates as study and think and is kind of um, Chinese private study platform where you can get all kinds of online tutoring and it's a paid resource. We also used the free resources from Khan Academy. My son finished all the math work for year seven during the few weeks of lockdown. So um, some parents who were able to go beyond the resources of the school, they actually had an opportunity during the pandemic. However, um, as we found, this was a small minority and it's a further source of inequality, of course, all those parents who did not have those resources um, in terms of financial, social, educational capital, their children actually lost out during the lockdown simply because the parents did not have sufficient information to fully support their children. And um, supporting home learning was difficult for the vast majority of parents, irrespective of their language background. And uh, in no way do I want to minimize um, the difficulties of other parents. I'm just saying there is another level an, of barrier of difficulty that is involved for parents who are not proficient in the language of the school. So to sum this all up, um, We've clearly shown in our study that there is a lack of systematic attention to the communication needs of linguistically diverse parents. And that is the case, despite the fact that um, the importance of parental engagement for student success is now no longer debated. I mean, it's well acknowledged. It's well acknowledged in the school system, in school policies. In New South Wales, there actually are policies that um, directed at parental engagement. Even so, this does not translate into effective communication to um, people with parents with limited English. Of course, um, limited parental English language proficiency is highly likely to translate into child educational disadvantage. And um, insufficient communication capacity that we saw in the enrollment websites, then during a time of crisis as the pandemic, when um, schools had to pivot really quickly to home learning, um, and, and where, you know, all the resources needed to go into just ensuring that home learning worked in general, kind of at, at, a, at a global level, where this pivot needed to take place quickly and under emergency conditions, the needs of linguistically diverse parents completely fell through. And so 
that's because there was no buffer built in to support linguistically diverse parents in, in, in the times of plenty or before the, before the pandemic. Um, I think the study has significant implications for teacher training in particular. I've just said there actually are policies for parental engagement and to ensure the engagement also of diverse parents. However, at the moment, um, the, the, the monolingual habitus of the multilingual school prevails and that will not change until decision makers and all stakeholders who can implement language policies at the school level actually have a better understanding of the language needs of linguistically diverse students, of course, but also linguistically diverse parents. Before I go, I just want to draw your attention that many of the studies um, and related studies that I've spoken about here are in one way or another collected on language on the move, particularly on our COVID-19 archive. So if you want to read more about um, communication challenges in linguistically diverse societies during a time of crisis, not only from the homeschool perspective, but from many other um, perspectives, public health communication and so on and so forth. Um, do come and visit. And with that, thank you very much for your attention. And I'll be looking forward to your questions and comments.